Kajaki Kilo 2 Bravo is the 2014 British film that Michael and I will be discussing in tonight's episode of War Stories. This film portrays the tragic, true events of a single day in September 2006 in Afghanistan, where a group of parachute regiment soldiers found themselves trapped in a minefield. This film depicts the truly futile nature of war and how the loss of any young British soldier is such an immense waste of life. This film deserves to be far more widely known. And if you haven't already seen it, I hope that our episode tonight convinces you to give it a watch. And once you've seen it, as hard as the viewing is, I do hope that you recommend the film to other people because it's a true story that needs to be heard. If you would like to support some of the veterans depicted in this film or many other British veterans of recent conflicts, then you will find a link in the description of this video to the Help for Heroes charity. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy tonight's episode of War Stories. Welcome, everybody, to War Stories. I'm so glad that we are back on track with this series. It's probably my favorite thing that I do on YouTube now. Um, and, Same here. Uh, yeah, Same here. I, it's it's a nice palate cleanser in many ways, but it also, I've always appreciated the fact that much like the Doctor Who show that I do, it, it kind of allows me to get away from the plastic for a while yeah. because I'm, like yourself, I'm very rooted in reading about history and also you know being plugged into certain types of events and things like that so this helps me also and it also helps me indulge in great cinema which you know we don't get to talk about a lot when we're talking about the 700th marvel legends variant of spider-man um okay so i wanted to open this with real quick you, go ahead great cinema we did an episode on flyboys we did we did i'm sorry <laughs> i should say i should amend that I should amend that. Uh, it allows us to do a series that explores cinema, sometimes yes. terrible cinema, sometimes great cinema. Tonight, this is great cinema, uh, but also poignant cinema. Um, before we get started, uh, Tony, I just wanted to right off the bat tell everybody that, um, and I'm, I'm, I really mean this, like when you suggested this movie and I, acquired it, was watching it. As I was watching it, I was well aware that you had watched it years ago and that this was going to be the first time you were re-watching it. Now, I don't want to diminish by saying what I'm about to say anything that you did in your combat experience. But I want you to know something. In a, in a strange way, when I was watching this, knowing that you were watching it for the second time for this show, I was like, you know, Tony's done some brave shit. But watching this for a second time may be the bravest thing he's ever done. Like, I, I was just like, holy crap, this is an intense movie. Like, yeah. and I've, I've watched some intense films, but knowing that you were going back in for another round, I was like, I was watching it going... Just having seen this once, I feel like I've escaped from a burning building. And Tony ran back in for another, <laughs> another. One. I'm like, what are you doing? So anyway, uh, yeah, this is um, this is a very unique movie. And I wanted to ask you before we even get into the plot, like you had some background in this before this movie ever came out, based on your own military history, and you knew some of these guys. What did you think when you heard? 
they're going to dramatize this in a film. When they were first talking about, about the project, um, this particular tour in Afghanistan, which was the summer of 2006, was, you know, the real height of the fighting with the Taliban. You know, the mm -hmm. British had had some very, very intense tours, and I'm uh, not trying to say that, you know, this tour was more intense than others. There, there was a period there probably mm -hmm. from... 2005 to 2008 where the fighting particularly in the summertime tours um because during the winter the taliban would go back into the mountains and replenish ready for an, uh, another round during the next summer it was a very very intense tour and i always wondered how they would achieve i wondered how a british cinema could do something on the um the scope of a of a hollywood movie you know they never normally have the, the funding and uh, this particular movie was actually crowd, um, partially crowdfunded by uh, veterans and supporters of veterans. Mm. And what they did, they took um, the, there's a there's a fantastic book written called uh, Three Para by mm. Patrick Bishop. This depicts the entire six month tour of the Third Battalion, the Parachute Regiment, um, in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, 2006. Mm -hmm. A very intense tour with a lot of different incidents, but they chose to hone on hone in on this particular single story um mm -hmm. in in the book you know it's a, it's a difficult read in the book but it's like five or six pages of a much broader story and what this film doesn't tell you is that at the day of this event there was also other things happening in Hellman province there were casualties mm -hmm. in other locations other british casualties there was fighting in other areas um this is a very, very difficult watch. Yeah, not just for me as a, as a veteran, for for any for any human being who feels yeah. emotion. This is yeah. a difficult watch. Yeah, but I also feel it is so very important, and I wish the film was much more widely known. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 that's why I exposed myself to a repeat viewing of this. Um, to sit down with you and yeah i'm very interested to hear your response you know you you mentioned the other day in in a private chat that you had watched the film mm -hmm. um and i almost said to you you know ah, oh, tell me all your thoughts mike and i was like no I've, I've got to save it i've got to save it for the episode well i have a few initial thoughts that are more about things that we talked about on a cinematic level and and why like you just mentioned why the film um didn't get more uh, uh, signal why it didn't get a boost yeah. in its signal why more people didn't see it or become aware of it I have some thoughts about that that have nothing to do with the movie itself it's it's because the movie is stellar it, it, it yeah. there's no there's no look about it like it was one of those it doesn't look like one of those war films that you click on on Netflix and you go oh, I've never no. heard of this and then you see just like a bunch of digital squibs it's not like that it's a pro movie it's very focused. It's almost like if Alfred Hitchcock had done a war film, this is the kind of war film he would have done um, because yeah. of the the very focused, com like compressed scenario, like in the high tension. Um, before we actually go into that, I wanted to uh, I wanted to uh, redeem the or redeem a promise that I made to everybody last week. We're just going to quickly, yeah, just wanted to quickly play this clip that actually oddly dovetails nicely into the movie we're mm -hmm. about to discuss. This is the clip I wanted in Bridge on the River Kwai, and somehow it never got exported. I don't know why. So here we go. What have I done? I didn't realize how poetically analogous that's going to be to what we're about to talk about because what you're yeah. seeing is you're seeing a british officer and he is suddenly rocked by an explosion that he didn't see coming uh and that is really the crux of of this film but before that we we traded a few messages back and forth tony about why this film wasn't seen more why it didn't get more press why it didn't get more 
uh, exposure, especially in the American market, where apparently it only brought in like seven thousand um, dollars. I assume part of that was a, a possibly a limited release. I bet you it was more mm-hmm. of an art an art house cinema distribution, which is too bad. It's that's unfortunate. However, uh, I I spent my formative years in England. I am a purveyor of world history, but especially British history and war and war history. And I watch a lot of British TV. I watch Australian television and movies. I, I, uh, uh, how do I put this? Uh, an above average percentage of my viewing is that kind of material. So when I'm, when I'm either watching a war story or a, British story or, you know, one or the other, I've gotten to a place where accents don't really bother me unless they're very extreme. Like I can, I can pick up uh, by, just by default, like on autopilot in any British production, I can get any accent flying around and I'm fine. Yeah. In a war story scenario where they're throwing around a lot of military acronyms and jargon, I can pick up about 90% of it with on autopilot. Yeah. What I didn't expect. And I mean, this was within the first few minutes of the movie. I'm getting lots of authentic regional accents because guys in the army are from all over the, all over great Britain, but they're also rapidly talking in the military jargon of the modern yeah. military. And I was going, now this is a new challenge because much like the movie Logan's Run, which I don't know how many people have seen the original Michael York Logan's Run, even though that's a fictional film. One of the things that I loved about Logan's Run was that it it had all this futuristic language in it that like the vernacular changes 3,000 years in the future or whatever. Yeah. And they're saying it, but they're not explaining to you with a crawl or bad expositional dialogue what that is. And so you're kind of, reaching for context clues in the dialogue and it's it, it helps your brain exercise a little bit and you eventually get where you need to be in this film within the first few seconds as that as that chinook lands and the guy gets out he hops in the jeep and they start driving off they are just throwing around authentic style dialogue with you know so accents combined with military jargon yep. and i'm going now, Melinda loves to have the subtitles on when we watch a movie because she listened to too much heavy metal when she was young. So she's lost <laughs> some of her hearing, right? I tend to see times where I don't watch a movie with Melinda as an opportunity to not have the subtitles on. And I went, I'm hearing what they're saying, but I need the context clue of a completed sentence in front of me to yeah. understand what they mean. Like I'm not mishearing words, but the words I'm hearing... So there's a lot going on. And I bet you that scared off American distributors. I bet you they were like the combo here, you know. I think even in, in to a degree, probably in, in the UK as well. I remember watching that for the first time. Um, I, again, I, I'm very good with accents, not just mm-hmm. because being from the UK, but, but serving in the military. Mm-hmm. You serve with all of these different accents. So I found that I could understand a Scotsman, a Welshman, Mm -hmm. a Geordie um, much better than someone from my hometown who had never really traveled anywhere. Right. Um, Watching this for the the first time, you know, Mm -hmm. as you said, the the accents, all of the acronyms, and I was like, man, they're they're not explaining these acronyms and Mm -hmm. this jargon. Right. I, to a degree, really respected that. But Me I'm too. Like, yeah. This would be very difficult for some people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember thinking back then, they've made this film for the veterans of the war. Yes. Yes. They they don't, I was going to say they don't care about the rest. That's, that's the wrong way of putting it. Their priority mm-hmm. was the veteran audience. Yeah. They're throwing, they're and throwing the, ca- sorry, go ahead. And, and and if that meant that, you know, the audience was going to have to struggle to keep up with mm-hmm. accents and, and acronyms, 
they weren't going to expire. I mean, you, you wouldn't in a document in a documentary. You might have you know titles come up at, at right. the bottom of the screen explaining what uh, something mm-hmm. that somebody said. But I think in the grand scheme of things, it's not all that important that you don't understand an acronym like Ill- illegal VCP, which mm-hmm. is an illegal vehicle checkpoint. Right. It doesn't matter. You still kind of get what's going on. Yeah, um, in that absolutely. Scene. I'm yeah. telling you where the the American film market's m- mentality often oh. is, which is dumb it down, yeah. dumb it down, dumb. Oh, this is too complicated, which is also a corporate mentality. So, it, but uh, just to give people sort of a uh, a sampling of this, this is not the. I have clips from earlier in the film I want to show too, but this is just my example of that moment where they pick up the guy from who gets out of the Chinook and gets into the Jeep, and they start having a conversation. It's just a little yep. brief moment here. What's the news? Uh, there was a heat wave back home. Heat wave? Pissed it down, mate. Anyway, where's the flat? Flat? Hat? It's all around you, mate. That is that is just the tip of the iceberg of how mm-hmm. much military jargon gets thrown around in this movie. And yeah, that's the way they would have talked uh, and, and do. And I, I don't see any reason for them to pander to the audience necessarily. It just ma- means that when you're watching this film, even as somebody who has no problem with English speaking accents of any kind, I was like, I'm going to need to see that sentence written out like so that I can. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So the, I, the go ahead. I, Rook, I also have a and I could be completely wrong on this. Um, when the movie was first released, it was simply called Kajaki. Mm-hmm. Then sometime after its release i think when it when it went from the cinematic release to uh the home video D- dvd release they changed the title to kilo to bravo uh-huh um perhaps because it hadn't done very well in cinemas they thought well, kajaki like it's it's the name of the place in afghanistan right not everyone knows what that is so when they changed the name to Kilo Two Bravo, that's the radio call sign of of the um, of the small unit uh, depicted mm-hmm. in this film. It sounds very similar to mm-hmm. Bravo Two Zero. Yes, perhaps that might work, but then maybe that didn't either. So if if you're searching for this film um, on the internet, you can either put in Kajaki, you can put mm-hmm. in Kilo Two Bravo, or then they changed the name again mm-hmm. and called it Kajaki. <laughs> yeah that's why i use that on the thumbnail i was like well yeah. i'm just gonna cover my bases uh brian <laughs> dillingham thank you for the dillinghamism sir good to see you here as always um yeah it's uh it's unfortunate that this this movie is probably going to be one of those that slow boils over time with with moviegoers they're gonna discover it they're gonna they're gonna discover it at some point and then it's gonna have this kind of renaissance almost a you know decade after its release i bet um the film opens with this beautiful shot uh that i'm going to revisit uh toward the end of a a guy swimming uh in a what's really a dammed up reservoir uh you find out it's a it's a reservoir from a recently built dam in afghanistan and they're trying to get a hydroelectric power plant started there um yeah he is the medic for three para the the head medic and um he uh is broken out of his tranquil swim because somebody has thrown a grenade into the water and he Mm -hmm. finds out it's locals who are just fishing and they're fishing with surplus grenades uh as somebody who is from the southern united states i'm not unfamiliar with this redneck tactic of (laughs) fishing uh i myself have not done it but i'm familiar with it uh here's just a little bit where he confronts the two kids who he he sees on the side of the the lake doing this let that be a lesson to you about the one about not walking into a room until you know how you're walking out of that tug. So he's standing there and he's he's he grills him for a little bit. They don't really care. Then he says, let that be a lesson right. to you. And then his buddies come walking up because he's suddenly self-conscious because he realizes he's standing there in Speedos. And he tries, yeah. to co- <laughs> he tries to cover himself up. And 
And then his buddies walk up and they're like, hey, you know, you probably should have thought about that before you confronted somebody. You know, you maybe want to put some clothes on before you do that. Um, yeah. Now, there aren't a lot of opportunities going forward into this discussion, everyone, for humor. Um, because there's going to come a point where if I tried to inflect humor into some of the stuff we're going to discuss later, it would actually feel like Michael's disrespectful or wow, what a jerk. But there is this one moment here right after they come up that I was like, this is an opportunity for some humor before we go into the heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, there's this, there's this bit where after they chide him for confronting these two kids in a swimsuit, they speak the local language to the two kids and take two of the fish that they've caught trying to be nice to them. Like, you know, and, and then they're like, you know, like, dude, you gotta, you gotta learn. Yeah. And uh, as they're walking away, there's this little bit uh, of dialogue where they're talking about the medic is like, I don't remember exactly. You'll hear the line in a minute, but he's like, I'm far away from home or I can't believe I'm out here all this way or whatever. And, and then the other guy says where he's from in England. And uh, it reminded me of a little bit from an episode of Graham Norton that I then tacked onto the end. So uh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> don't pick a fight with an armed midget. A long way from home. What are you talking about? You're from Huddersfield. It's a real place. Where are you from? <laughs> Huddersfield. <laughs> <laughs> so, I I don't know why. I just there are sections of Graham Norton that I, I have committed to memory, and so when the guy said you're from Huddersfield, and I went, oh, and I'm like, I gotta go get that clip and put it in. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Chroma 1000 here is, is, is saying, you know, that the, the guys in the actual situation were using humor to get through it. That, that's a very big part of this mm -hmm. story is yeah. the, the, the humor and the banter between soldiers. But I think um, what Michael is saying is we're going to be discussing their use of humor right. in this situation quite a lot. Right. But we are not going to be making fun of this situation yeah. Yeah. yeah like i'm not going to be cutting in like so for example one of the big things that they talk about in this movie early on and then it becomes almost like a a theme it becomes kind of a is uh, the importance of the high ground their yes. position is on the high ground they're constantly looking at the guys on the high ground around the wadi they need to get their friend in the stretcher to the highest point of the wadi that is a whole thing. But if I was to suddenly show you a clip from that and then cut to Obi-Wan going, I have the high ground, you guys would probably be like, uh, you're kind of being a jerk, Michael. Like, that's what I mean. Yeah. We're, we're going to be talking yeah. about humor, but I'm not going to be throwing it in there into, into the clips. Um, so they pick up the new guy and they bring him back to their, um, what would you call it? Their position, their... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fire support base. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I suppose for, for those people who haven't seen the film, I'll, I'll just, I'll set a little mm -hmm. bit of context here. So Kajaki is the name of a hydroelectric dam in Southern Afghanistan in Helmand province. Um, I believe the hydroelectric part of the dam had actually been there a while, but was not functioning. Mm -hmm. Um, so they have engineers work like like um foreign contract engineers yep. working there trying to get the hydroelectricity going there are some american private security guys there one's called one's nickname is kajaki john mm -hmm. um they're there kind of guarding the engineers at the dam this was one of the most strategically important installations in the british area of operations in afghanistan they had to protect this area now Fortunately, um, there was two very, very high peaks near Kajaki Dam. Um, so they had fire support bases on the top of these peaks, which were, were codenamed after um, was it Athens and Normandy, mm -hmm. um, you know, two places where the Paris have, had, had fought in World War II. So, um, yeah, you've got the fire support bases on the top of these hills, um, being able to 
Overwatch. So it's it's not a huge contingent of soldiers there, mm -hmm. but because they're on the high ground, they're beyond um, the range of small arms and mm -hmm. RPGs. The Taliban don't have um, air support. You know, they don't have right. fighter jets, helicopters. So when they're in that position, yes, they can come under attack, but they have mm -hmm. the superior position. Right. Um, supported with, you know, heavy machine gun, mortars, uh, that kind of thing. So we're kind of introduced to the base by um, a signaler. Um, mm -hmm. That's what the British military we call a radio man. Uh, a signaler who has earlier on in the tour fought in another part of Afghanistan, but then he had, you know, a couple of weeks leave back in the UK. Mm -hmm. He returns. He's the one who gets off the helicopter. And, um, yeah, we get introduced a little bit to um, what life was like for the British soldier in Afghanistan in 2006, the way they lived. You know, these yeah. guys probably would have been – they would have been rotated through during this kind of six-month tour. Um, but I would say those guys would have done at least a month in that location living mm -hmm. in those conditions. So Yeah, and there's, there's different sort of – outposts as part of their little network on top of that hill so so they or or mini mountain whatever you want to call it so they they have like a central point but then they also have these little areas that are kind of a walk between them but they're all part yeah. of their support base there is this moment here at the beginning right as the jeep pulls up where it's going to stop and let everybody out and deliver the latest round of you know equipment and sun, sundries and packages and stuff and there's this telling moment that I, as a lifelong film goer, I was like, my my ears were like, okay, this is going to come into play later, uh, right here. I hope you know how to use a radio without battery signaler, Jones. For fuck's sake. Like, they find out they had a radio, but they don't have any batteries for the radio. And I'm, I'm going, I was like, are, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> um... And then, as Tony said, they are the, the new guy is given the lay of the land. You're in here with the medic and the med store. HQ, mortar pit. There's about 60 not here at Athens. Seven, eight up at Normandy. That's it. Stay on Mark Tracks. Enjoy. Stay on the Mark Tracks. So we're already now being to told through context clues that it's not safe to stray off the paths around here. Like, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's not good. Um, and then he's talking to the medic after he gets checked out. Um, he gets a little bit of a physical around his uh, privates. <laughs> and then he, him and the medic talk about the position. And there's this little moment. Happy birthday. He says, make sure you save until a big day. When's that? Seventh. Where, where are we now? We own all this high ground. Out of small arms range. A few Chinese rockets, bit of boom boom in the valley, but that's it. Okay, because we're out of our mind. So it's like we got no bat, new, we have no fresh batteries for the radio. Now we find out that they really don't have any ammo left. And I'm going, you know, like, is he just being darkly funny or is he, is he being serious? You know, and no, by, 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 by 2006, you know, since the, I'll call it the worldwide war on terror. Um, when, you know, following September 11, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the British military were not prepared for this. Right. Um, that they wouldn't even start getting updated equipment until probably 2008, 2009. Wow. Um, during this period, I've, you know, they, they had used so many resources in the early years of the war that, um, that they were stretched thin in every mm -hmm. area possible. And, and this is just one location at Kajaki Dam. You had other places in right. towns like Mangin and Musakala, you know, where there were, were there was a siege in Sangin where the guys were, were trapped for, for several weeks. And, um, you know, they couldn't get, they were too concerned about helicopters being shot down by RPGs. Mm -hmm. um, so they were kind of airdropping supplies, but the guys were constantly running low on ammunition, rations, water, medical supplies radio batteries mm -hmm. um yeah they were not um they were not set up for success when it when it came to equipment and resources and i was also i don't expect like i, I know that the military and real warfare is not like gi joe like where you know you've just got these amazing headquarters and stuff like that i get that 
But I am constantly shocked when I see both American and British uh, bases in the war in Afghanistan from tactical positions. I am always shocked to see how rudimentary they are. Like there's really not a lot there. It's like, yeah, nope. we've got we got like a tarp and uh, it's kind of fluttering over this kind of makeshift mound igloo that we kind of put together ourselves. And um, that's it. Like you're, you're hanging out in the dirt or maybe you can go get some shade at a certain time of day on one side of that rock. And I was yeah. like, I was like, okay. And every time I see that, it's very, it's very sobering to, re to realize that in 2006, this is what it still looks like with boots on the ground, you know? Um, so then we get a little bit of what they do to kill time because they're, they're just watching the, the, the roads and they're, they're killing time. And uh, you got one guy, uh, two guys, the medic, and um, I think it's his co-medic who are playing chess with sand filled water bottles that have different color caps on them. So, short yeah. water bottles of the pawns and the other water bottles are the different kings bishops and stuff and they're playing water bottle chess um you have a bunch of guys playing this game that keeps coming back where it's guess who i who i am or guess who you are yeah. they 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 write a name and they stick it backwards on your forehead and then you can only ask questions and you're trying to figure out who who they've made you you know whether it's yeah. oliver cromwell or you know whatever and it's almost like guess who I guess it is guess who. Um, yeah. And then there's this little moment, because as we've seen in other war films, the the things that you'll do to, to kill time include skill building on some level. Hey, Smooch, watch this. Ready? Impressive. <laughs> Ninja fingers, mate. I've always wanted ninja fingers. <laughs> I've, I've, I've always wanted to be able to do that card trick I, that's the only card trick i care about learning how to do and i've never bothered to try also i've got these yeah. rat claws so it probably wouldn't work um so uh so you kind of got you've kind of got the, the their world set up they've established for the audience the geography of all of this and then it's the first night and the guys on on night night watch are looking down at this petrol station that's down there a very primitive afghani petrol station where there's been constant trouble they've been they've been observing constant issues you know people coming in late at night and uh they yeah. they notice these guys come in in a pickup truck and they're offloading a bunch of stuff through their night vision binoculars and they're like oh god here we go again and those guys just start opening up from that petrol station in a, in a futile way. They, they start trying to just throw lead at, yeah, yeah. at the fire base. So uh, they, they say, well, let's radio the other observation point, meaning in their group. Uh, yeah. So here we go. I persisted, little bastards. Kilo two, this is kilo five, over. Killer five to killer two. What the f was that over? <laughs> so, so Tony, my next question. Um, I assumed at, in that moment that he was keeping his radio off to save batteries. Yeah, correct. Okay, okay, great. Because so, I was like, I know the other guy's frustrated, but like, you know, he's got to shoot his gun up in the air to get the other guy to even check in. But at the same time, I'm like, OK, they're trying to conserve their their battery uh, life on these radios. So, OK, good. I was like, I don't think those guys would be that irresponsible. Um, no, no, that's yeah, that's exactly what's going on there. And yeah, you see, like um, when he responds, mm -hmm. um, when, when the sergeant picks up the radio and, and responds. He's a little bit frustrated, but it's like, oh, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, know, he, he gets it. You, you need yeah. to get our attention. Yeah, right uh they call in when the guys start firing at them they call in for air support to take out this target once and for all and this occurs hey 
Pitman 1-1. One, one. Missed target. Request another run. Pitman 1-1. One, one. Negative with a 1-3. I am Bingo Fuel. Or TP. I, they missed the target by at least a football pitch. Like they missed. Yeah. And he's like, can you make another pass at that? And they're like, nah, um, we're out of ammo or whatever. We're, we're headed back. And in, I in, that, in that particular scene, I think I think that's a, a Danish aircraft and a Danish mm -hmm. fighter pilot. I think that's what they say. Right. Um, where in a lot of other movie productions, okay, they, they, they do make fun of the guy a little bit. Mm -hmm. But they have some context clues kind of just before that to... To, you know, we're not trying to make the Danish pilot look completely incompetent. So right. there is a, a conversation when um, Corporal Mark Wright is, uh, I think they go they go to wake him up, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, and he's like, no, 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 I'm already here. The reason they need to get him up is he is their forward air controller. Right. So while they're all on the radio to each other and probably back to Camp Bastion, he's the one who actually gets on the radio and speaks to mm -hmm. the pilots, whether they're Apaches, whoever. So he speaks to her and the pilot says to him prior to this happening, no laser guided munitions, which means mm -hmm. they can't point a laser at the target. Right. So what they do instead, they, f they fire um, a an illumination round from the mortar. Mm -hmm. um, they fire that in the air. They, they count down the seconds. It goes off. And then there's a moment where they, they, they turn around to the, the mortar team and go spot on target. You know, you've got that mortar dead on target. And then this guy... Basically, he's then, you know, 30,000 feet in the air, aiming at this bright dot on the ground and, mm -hmm. yeah, and this is by a football field. So <laughs> <laughs> it's it's tragic, you know, because you know that, like, they're going to have to put up with this petrol station group again at some point in the future, whoever's yeah. occupying the fire base. Um, but, yeah, they say, you know, well, at least it shut them up. In other words, they're like, they clearly tucked tail and ran after they they were almost hit by that that, that uh attack so uh then in the early morning and and, th and just for everybody's edification here when i saw that scene i put a little notation in my brain next to the no batteries for the radio i was like okay no batteries for the radio and they're frustrated by air support I have a feeling these two things are going to come into play later. And I was not wrong. Um, and for anybody who watches a lot of war films, uh, especially ones that are factually based, there is a long standing frustration between ground soldiers and air support there. It doesn't matter what army you're in. There's, yep. <laughs> there's a constant tension there. Uh understandably so so early in the morning two of the guys are talking uh that's the new guy and the forward air controller i believe and they're they're both looking out over the the, yeah. the wadi and he's telling him about the situation with what they're surrounded by uh historically he's putting it in a historical context and he says this mate this whole country's full of shit left behind when armies off roads Thanks, Mujahideen. Russians, it was the mines. Ten million f***ing mines. So he says that the Russians, when they were here, they left behind ten million landmines. Yeah. And it nobody really knows where all of them are. Like, you know, they, they're they all over the countryside. They're all over the place. Um which what that this is where that line there is going to inform a lot of questions I have in a few minutes for you, mm -hmm. Tony, about about the way this all kind of plays out. Um, because the next thing we see, and I have a clip of this as well, is we see them through a sniper position observe uh, an illegal traffic stop of some kind. It's yeah. it's the what would that I mean? What was that? Put that in context for us, Tony, like what they're observing, not just in this movie, but in, in general, in, in military terms. Yeah. So, so the, the, the acronym is, is a VCP. So mm -hmm. a, ve a vehicle checkpoint, um, this, you know, they refer to as an, as an illegal VCP. So mm -hmm. 
they're watching the guys down on this road, and basically it's some armed men on the road who are stopping the traffic, trying to traverse that, mm -hmm. that route. Um, and I think at one point they mentioned like cash changing hands or something. Mm -hmm. They're basically they're extorting money out of a local saying, if you want to come down this road, you've got to pay us to get through. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an illegal checkpoint, you know, it's not the Afghan army, um, you know, ar armed men dressed in that way. It's most likely the Taliban, and that's an illegal checkpoint. So what are we what are we gonna do about it? You know, it's within their um uh rules of engagement um that 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 they are expected to do something about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh that's kind of where I was starting to have questions because of what they decide to do. I get that they're obligated because they're the, the fire support base in the area that they have an obligation to investigate that and stop those kind of things from happening, just like with the petrol station. Mm -hmm. um, but this all comes right after we've heard the conversation about 10 million Russian landmines that could be anywhere. Right. Yeah. So they, so I'll just show everybody this clip because it goes from what they observe to what they decide to do. It's two adults, looks like uh, two children, cash changing hands. Range? Two five, two eight. Too far for the snipe. Yeah, from there, yeah. Down the goat's track to the southeast, re entrance to the wadi, up the slope to the west ridge. So they've decided they're going to try and get closer where their sniper uh, rifle will be more effective or will, will yep. be effective. But to do that, they're going to go down this goat track and then, you know, across the wadi and up the ridge. And at that moment, I admit, Tony, I was thinking. And again, this is no knock on the film at all. This is just more my brain. My wheels are turning and I'm going. OK, they must be led to believe that the wadi down there is not a landmine danger. But why would they think that there must have been a report or something, some sort of military context clue for them that made them feel like that's an unlikely place for landmines? Do you have any? Any? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I believe. Um, that they were obviously prepared for landmines. You'll, you'll notice mm -hmm. later on there's certain very rudimentary pieces of equipment that they're carrying, mm -hmm. the little white and red flags on the yeah. pin. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of prepared for, for this situation. But <clears throat> when they're having that discussion about what they should do about this VCP, mm -hmm. um, just in case anyone in the chat's kind of wondering, because there are civilians there, they even mention there's a couple of children. Like mm -hmm. They can't fire mortars. They can't fire heavy machine guns because they're not accurate enough. The only thing they can really do is is use a sniper rifle, and um, I don't want to make the assumption of the decisions that were being made in these guys' heads at the time. But they had been there quite a while. Mm -hmm. You've already seen the you know the level of boredom has driven them to play chess with water bottles and you right. know, play guess who and and all this. So maybe it's just ah, oh, come, come on. Let, to make it something a little bit different and maybe they took a slight risk um mm -hmm. but yeah they 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 selected a, a a ridge kind of halfway between them and the illegal vcp where they said all right if we can get a small team there with a sniper we can engage them um from there mm -hmm. they have already talked about the march track so yeah they're, they're going into an area where yes there could possibly be mines I think you also need to understand these guys have probably September in, in a summer tour, they've probably been in Afghanistan four or five months already mm -hmm. and have served in other parts of hell, man, like Sangin and Musakala, where there was a very real threat of um, IEDs being laid by the Taliban. Right. And a lot of the time they're fighting in areas where in small towns and villages where people live, where, over the last 20 years, the Russian mines have been cleared out of those areas if they were ever there. Right. So perhaps there's a little bit of a pos possibility of complacency. Mm -hmm. um, realistically, I, I think it's one of those things where had they have made it to that ridge and the sniper had have 
you know, fired, say, let's say three rounds and taken out three Taliban guys. Mm -hmm. And we later discovered that one of them was the the new local commander and he was high profile. I'd be getting a, a medal and, you know, there'd be a, a little story written about him somewhere. And maybe people in the military would know about it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, yeah, awesome. Because of the way the events unfold, it's easy for us to sit here with hindsight going, should they really have gone down there? Um, I, I get that they were obligated to from, from an, a responsibility perspective of their area. What, yeah. what I, it's not a question for me of should they go deal with this, this vehicle checkpoint? I, they absolutely should. My question was simply they're, they're, they're going to take the goat track down through the wadi and, and then straight up. And I was like, okay, well, um, I guess they kind of are confident that there's no, 10 million Russian landmines down there because they just had that discussion. And, and I don't think, I don't think that reflects stupidity on them. I was assuming that they had some kind of reasonable expectation. And even throughout the movie, you know, as the movie continues to unfold, they're still baffled about what, on what does unfold in the Wadi. They're still baffled about what the hell, yeah. why is this a thing? Um, so that's, that's all, that's the only reason I was asking. Um, so they get down there and they promised them that there would be a radio check once they got to the bottom because they're like, once you get into that wadi, you radio check before you go any further because we got to make sure we can stay in contact. And yep. here's the radio check. Radio check, mate. Kilo two, okay, over. Okay, okay. And at that point, we as the viewers now know wherever they've just walked into, like not good. Um, mm -hmm. And and they run over to their friend, and he's lost a leg, and uh, from the below the knee, and they're trying yeah. to get that the bleeding stopped and all that kind of stuff, and they uh, they try to radio for help. They've just done a radio check. They've just done it and successfully contacted their guys. And this is what happens. Uh, City Low 2, Bravo, come in. Uh, Kilo 2, uh, Kilo 2, uh, Bravo, come in. For uh, sake. Suddenly the, the radio ain't working. And when, when they try and contact them back because they heard the mine explode from way down in the wadi, their buddies on the other end... This is going on. Hello, Kilo 5, it's Kilo 2. Fucking piece of fucking shit. What's happening? Shu Hao went on a patrol. I think he trod on a mine. And because all this is based on real events, you're going, man, it, Murphy's Law. Talk about, like, we tested the, the radios, everything was fine, but the moment we really need them seconds later, pff, nothing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you ever use the phrase Murphy's Law and someone doesn't understand what you're talking about, you tell them, mm -hmm. go and watch this movie. This movie should have been called Kajaki, Murphy's Law Unfolds. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, what the uh, redundant, what is it? Uh, is it redundant contingencies? Or um, it's kind of like with Titanic, where, you know, they put in all these fail safes and. Yeah nothing actually worked every every fail safe failed um, yeah. and uh so they're you know they're following procedure they're not being irresponsible they're doing their job but unfortunately they haven't been adequately resupplied they haven't been and you know here we are much like battle of the bulge in many ways where you know everybody in in bastone was just living on breadcrumbs staying in yeah. those foxholes running out of ammo no winter coats kind of the same thing um, except they're not cold. Um, so uh, now they now they realize we've got to get our guy out of here. And the only way we're going to do that because of the nature of his injury, we can't carry him up a hill even on a stretcher because we can't guarantee he'll stay level. And that could cause, according to the medic, that could cause him to start bleeding again. That could cause him to bleed through the tourniquet. We've got to yep. get him out via a lift winch from a helicopter, like a helicopter sends down a stretcher. They put him on it and then they send him back up. And 
they're like, well, we can't have we can't have the the winch come down right in the middle of this wadi because one, um, there could be mines all around while we're trying to get him set up. Two, it's it's not it wasn't as feasible as it would be if they could get him to a more solid piece of ground, I guess. And yeah. they see this, they see this flat rock that's over at, toward one end of the wadi, this big sort of flat rock. And they're like, we've got to get him on the stretcher and then get him to this rock. And that way the helicopter that shows up will be able to land on this solid piece of ground which, where we know there are no landmines and then we can get, get him up and away. And uh, to do that, they have to create a path. Um, yeah. and I know that for anybody who has seen, um, Rambo three, and I'm, I love Rambo three, so I'm not about to throw shade at it, but for anyone who's seen Rambo three, you've seen traversing a minefield with the knife and the, this and the, that, um, that's Rambo. Yeah. This is actual mine hunting with a combat knife and it is harrowing. Um Right lads, listen up. This is I need two alpha. bodies to help clear the route over there. At least if it's this hard they won't detonate if you walk over them. I don't think that's how it work. <laughs> At least if it's this hard they won't detonate when you walk over. He's like, I don't think that's how these work. <laughs> <laughs> like this is, and he you know, they run into one mine and they red flag it and then they move over and they keep going and they get to the rock and they get him on uh, the rock. But they, they establish right here. Passive. So they've done the they've done the traversing the, you know, checking. They get to the rock. Yeah. He slowly walks back on the path they've flagged. Everything's good. He's like, the path is safe. And then they get their boy over to the Tell spot. Tell me a great. Nah, but I've got a couple of ripe plums here if you want. <laughs> kill five Bravo to kill five Alpha. So they get him over there. The medics are with him. They're calling the they're calling in the the, the airlift. Um and this is this is something that starts to happen throughout the film. The airlift is always reporting back. We'll be there in ten minutes. And the ten <laughs> yeah, minutes. Um, you you learn you learn in the army <clears throat> this phrase: "Hurry up and wait." Mm -hmm. And you know, on the bus, off the bus. And I've been sat on rifle ranges. You know, cold, wet, miserable day in Wales. Mm -hmm. You've been on a range all day. You're waiting for the trucks to arrive to take you back to base to have dinner. When will the trucks be here? They'll be here in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. like hours later. Yeah. Um, real quick, um, Cute Fluff is asking, no engineers. They established earlier on in the film, between Athens and Normandy, there were, I think, 23 soldiers in total. Mm -hmm. um, they're parachute regiment guys. They're, they're, they're trained. So I do want to talk a little bit about Mm -hmm. uh, landmines, I suppose, to give people a little bit of context here. So yeah. I'll, I'll go back to that scene in Rambo 3 for those who know it. Um, the sand is very, very soft. Rambo's got his big combat knife and he's literally going <laughs> and moving really, really fast. And he finds one mine and he just levers it up, which you would never do because right. there could be a, um, another device underneath. But he levers it up, you know, for cinematic purposes to show the mine. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge anti-tank mine. What these soldiers are dealing with in this wadi are very small anti-personnel mines. They are kind of, some of them can be like the size of a small tin of tuna, you know, mm -hmm. someone might take to, to lunch, maybe a little bit bigger tin of beans. They don't take a lot of pressure to go off, um, and they are designed to maim soldiers. They're not designed to kill them. They're designed literally to have enough explosive and, and shrapnel to take off a foot. Mm -hmm. the reason being... Um, they you get taught this in you know if, if certainly if you're in a combat arm of the military, if you kill an enemy soldier, you have taken one person off the battlefield. If you wound an enemy soldier, you've taken five off the battlefield because it's going to take at least four guys to carry the stretcher to get him out. Right, and as you can see in, the, in this situation, 
more and more people are coming into the wadi, perhaps more than should be coming into the wadi. Mm -hmm. um, but when they're doing that, that mind clearing, you are taught, first of all, to clear all of the very, very loose gravel with your fingers. You know, you might just find, you know, the outer edge of a mine or something. <clears throat> and then you'd have prod the ground with your bayonet and you're supposed to lay your hand down like that and put it between your, your fingers at a certain angle, um, not to go too mm -hmm. far down. That would have taken a very, very long time for them to, to clear that. But you can see that compacted ground. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are Russian mines. The Russians had not been in the country for 20 years at this point. 20 years of weather and winters more soil could could land on top. Like the guy says, I don't think that's how it works. Right. These mines could now be this far under the ground. I think what one of one of the, you know you, when you see the explosion, the actual hole in the ground is quite deep. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still that pressure of a, of a human that, that's detonated it. So, right. Um, yeah, I, I hope that gives people a little bit of understanding um, mm -hmm. of what these guys are facing. So even though they've they've cleared a path. Um, it's never a hundred percent, and I believe these mines were also made of plastic as well. So, like uh, metal detectors would not have helped them. Uh, well, the they they've got the the area where they triaged him, and they've got a path to this rock, and they've yep. established so you know that the path is safe. They get him to the rock, and then the medics are sitting there on the rock with him. And Stu, who is his friend, who helped, who ordered the path to be laid. Stu is like, okay, you, you're going to be all right. We're going to get you out of here. And then he's, he starts walking back to um, the, uh, is, it, is it Mark? The advanced fire? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so this is uh, what happens next. What the f*** am I just doing down here, mate? So they've literally just walked back to the same spot where they were triaging the first guy on the flagged path. And I thought it was one, it's just a, what, but the other thing is that Mark is like, what are mines doing down here? And right at that moment, as you saw, Stu steps on a mine right in the area where they were all congregating to help triage their friend. So now yeah. you're in an unpredictable situation with these landmines. Like they're they're deep under your feet. You have no idea because apparently you can walk over them a random number of times and maybe nothing will happen. But you walk over them one more time, and and so the, now they really don't know. All bets are off, and yeah. Stu has now lost uh, a leg and and he's now you know messed up, and they've got to figure out how they're going to help him. Uh, so now they're calling in or again saying, Hey, we've got, we now need two extractions and, um, the, the helicopter and, and keep, keep in mind, guys, I'm showing you bits that I feel like I can show you on, on YouTube because this, this movie is very intense. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm not showing that, that involves them trying to, you know, uh, get tourniquets around wounds and, yeah. and, and, and help stabilize their friends and their friends are, you know, the, the, there's two things going on as far as the emotions uh, of these guys. One, even in the midst of this intense trauma, they're still trying to joke with one another about what's just happened. So, you know, like when, before Stu got hit and he was, he was tri helping triage his own, his, the first guy, he was telling him, he was like, look, he's like, it's going to be fine. You and I, you know, we're going to be, you know, drinking in a week and, and you're going to be okay. And, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about this, you know, uh, over a pint or whatever. And now Stu is the one hurt and they're trying to get him morphine and do all this stuff, but they're always trying to uh, keep their morale up on some level, even as they're in yeah. pain and all this kind of stuff. Uh Tony, did you have something? I didn't know if you had a thought. <clears throat> yeah, well, just just on that whole humor mm -hmm. piece, I, for me personally, one of the most difficult parts of my transition 
from the military private security mm -hmm. back into civilian life was that um, people did not understand my sense of humour. Mm -hmm. There is a moment um, before this incident occurs, just as, um, by pure coincidence, both of the guys who have now stepped on mines are both called Stu. Mm -hmm. Stu mm -hmm. Hale is the sniper who first went down. Stu Pearson um, was the, like the um, the section corporal uh, mm -hmm. at the time, kind of made that made the call. As Stu Hale is is heading off down into the wadi, he says to Stu, Stu Pearson, um, "You know, if anything happens to me, tell your mum I love her." <laughs> yeah. now, when, when you kind of joke with normal people, and and you introduce someone's mother into the joke. There's that whole thing, you know, you don't talk about my mom. Right, and, right. You know, that's not just an American. That's a, that's a, a British yep. thing. And Stu Pearson's reaction is, yeah, righto, I'll tell her. Yeah. <laughs> that is the way the relationships are built up through training. You, mm -hmm. you, you, you develop this level of respect for one another through through going through some of the most intense training the British Army has to offer. Right. These shared right. experiences you've gone through that you can now use the, this humor so um it's one of the things I, I really respect about the movie is how they they get it right like mm -hmm. i probably think on, on the day that the humor probably would have been the, the crass level probably would have even been a little bit higher right um you know but there, there, there's one point um you see that there's when they're dealing with the first casualty there's a lot of writing on the face with with a Mm -hmm. um, a permanent marker pen. Um, that is so that what they're marking on there is each time they give him morphine, the time they gave it to him, mm -hmm. so that when he gets back to medical aid, whether it's Camp Bastion or, or wherever it is, the medics can see on, on his face, right, he's had two lots of morphine, one at 12 o'clock, one at 2 o'clock. They might write on there, um, you know, how many tourniquets they put, things like that. Mm -hmm. As as the medic is riding on the side of his face, and he's you know he's riding morphine in the time, and he leans over, and he's, what, what's that? I am gay. He's like, that, right. that's not the time for right. that. Yeah, that's they you know, um, black humor is very much a way of dealing with difficult situations. It's 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 a time proven tradition in, in the British military, right? Um, uh, cute fluff. I just want to point out uh, he was going back the way they came. That's the whole. That's the whole yes. situation. He was going back exactly the way they came and blew and blew a mine anyway. That's why yeah. this whole thing suddenly all bets are off at this point because now they realize their tactics for safely traversing a minefield don't apply to this situation for whatever reason. Yeah. They don't apply. Um, it's interesting that when, when the first mine detonates, when Stu mm -hmm. Hale steps on it. And then the, the medic, you know, who, who who one minute had had the successful radio um, radio check, he runs, you know, three, four, five meters towards Stu Hale, just slightly mm -hmm. further into the wadi. Um, there were some people asking in the chat, just that extra three or four meters deeper into the wadi could have been what prevented the next radio check. Right. Um, but when he arrives, Stu Hale saying to him, he's like, don't worry about me, you know, eyes on contact front. I've been hit by a mortar. And he's mm -hmm. like, you haven't, man. You stepped on a mine. Mm -hmm. He actually thought they were being engaged by the Taliban. Right. Um, so when they clear that path, you'll see that they use very small, you know, and they, they've homemade these things, little mm -hmm. pieces of white and red ribbon yep. with a, a bit of um, a bit of wire folded over to hold the ribbon. The white ribbons they mark on each side, that denotes this is the clear path. Mm -hmm. And a red ribbon is, right, we found a mine there. Don't. They're not going to clear that mine. They're just going, right, right don't, don't step where the red ribbon is kind of thing. Yeah. And yes, Stu Pearson walks, you know, they clear that path. Stu Pearson walks back along it to the casualty. Mm -hmm. A large group of them walk down the path with the stretcher to the rock. So they've gone traversed two or three times now. Mm -hmm. And Stu Pearson walks back again and the mine detonates. Yeah. In, in, in a path that they thought was safe. Mm-hmm. Unreal. Uh, well, literally real, but still, your the brain can't process it. So yeah. they're 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 trying to help the other stew now, 
uh, who is back in the same area where the first guy got hit. And now they, they don't feel comfortable moving him to the flat rock because they can't trust the path they thought was safe. So they're leaving, they're, they're, they're working on him right there. And the helicopter, the first helicopter shows up, but it's not what they need. It doesn't have a winch. It's a Chinook with a rear yeah. drop cargo uh, pla uh, door. And they're like, there's nowhere you can come in to this space to load up the first casualty. And they're like, well, maybe you can kind of like back your rear end up here, but you're going to have to get close. And the moment they start coming in toward the flat rock backwards to try and, and they're like, come on, bring the guy over. All the guys on the, on the rock with him, all the medics and all of his buddies are like, do you, they're screaming at him like, this is a minefield. You are endangering yep. us with the rotor blades, throwing rocks everywhere all over this wadi and doing all this stuff. And the, the helicopter guys don't understand what's going on. And so this occurs. Charlie, what's going on? Little blue something. I can't work it out. They're trying to say that this is a, what does they say? AT... ATO or something like that, or eight AT. It's an acronym. They're going yeah. AT something, and it means minefield. And um, and they can't work out what they're trying to tell them, even though they're screaming against the rotor sound and they're trying to mime letters. The helicopter guy's like, uh. So they finally just tell him go away because you're endangering us. Like you're you're making this worse. Like you this is you're blowing rocks all over the wadi, and another mine could go off. They're like, get out of here. And as they finally get the message and they start to fly away, they kick up more stuff. And they blow up another mine. The, the helicopter manages to blow another mine up right in the triage area for the first two mines blew up. Um, so now... The guys that were helping Stu are wounded, and Stu is wounded again by another mine. Um, it's, it's, a at, hmm? it's at this point here that if you, if this was a fictional story, people at this point would be going, An another mine's got, oh, you know, they, they, these people can't. This writer's awful. Like, mm -hmm. that's so improbable. After the second one, these guys—they're not going to move. This, this is this is real life. Yeah, the second mine. The, sorry, the the first mine was an accident. Mm -hmm. The second mine, they believed. You know, they had cleared this path. They had traversed it a few times. They thought the path was safe. The second mine goes off. Now everyone is petrified to move even an inch. Right. You know, they believe there's mines everywhere. This third mine is detonated by the downdraft of the Chinook taking off. Right. Um, which is dislodging all you know the, the rocks on the, the walls of the wadi mm -hmm. falling down. And and yeah, and, and, a, and a third mine detonates. This one is not detonated by someone stepping on it. This is caused by the Chinook, the Chinook that they specifically said they didn't want. They wanted right. a um, winch. A, a, a winch, which yeah. would have been an American Black Hawk. Now, yeah. The communication issues they were having were, were, were not helping, but mm -hmm. um, what you're basically, you, you've got a British force who is trying to get back to their main kind of comms headquarters at Camp Bastion, who are then trying to get the officers there to go to the Americans. You know, we need winch capable assets to get these guys out. And, right. you know, I, I believe in the background that that was taking so long, the British were like, send the Chinooks, it's all we've got. Um, right and it actually made the situation worse uh yeah it's um it's a staggering situation uh cute fluff asks tony what would you do in this situation um no i i i could see myself ending up in you know, th thank heavens I, I i didn't i i, I can't imagine the, the mm -hmm. level of physical and emotional trauma that these guys went through. But that that decision that they made at the start, Stu Howell going down there, you know, had I have been kind of, whether I had been the sniper or the corporal or, or whatever, um, 
I probably would have. Yeah, you know, let's let's take this risk. Let's go and engage mm -hmm. that VC. I very, uh, I very easily could have ended up in 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 this situation, and 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 quite possibly even, you know, I, I think to a degree after that first mine strike, the guys probably thought it was it was a single random mine, mm -hmm. um, and they're so concerned with their close friend who's just had his lower leg blown off that they're not even thinking about the possibility that they're in a much more dire situation. Um, and yeah, and more and more people come, more and more people come into it. You know, there's another medic team that, that, that comes in um, just prior to the, to the Chinook to help out Stu have because they need more medical equipment. So. Yeah. Um, I couldn't help during the third detonation thinking to myself, uh, I'm sure you've seen the footage of this back in the day, but you remember how in World War II, uh, leading up to D-Day, the British army was coming up with all of these, they were almost like the precursor to GI Joe style vehicles, action force type vehicles yeah, where yeah. they had specific purposes, you know, like it was, it wasn't just a tank. Like it was like, this this vehicle is a vehicle that's designed to do X. And one of them, they were trying to come up with a vehicle that could clear a minefield in minutes. And it was a tank body, but it had these chains on a thing on the yep. front that would spin real fast in front of it. So they would whip out like several meters, you know, in front of the thing and blow up mines as the thing rolled forward. And all I was thinking the whole time was, God, I hope after they get out of here, they bring that thing out of mothballs and just drive it through the wadi and see what happened. You know, like, like I was like, they got to clear this area, but that was just an idle thought I had. Um, yeah. So at that point uh, we now have Stu is wounded twice. The, the second Stu has been wounded twice, miraculously still alive. Uh, now you've got Mark is down and uh, you got one guy who escaped the blast sort of, he was on the peripheral periphery and he's just not moving in a kneeling position because obviously there can now, there are literally mines under them all over the place. Yeah. And the medic from the flat rock, the guy from the beginning in the speedo is asking this guy, what's the medical situation with our boys? Um, box taking it in the chest. It's choosing hit again. The meds down. So, they're getting a situation report, sit rep, and uh, the guy who's still in the area who hasn't been wounded, but he's stuck there, he kind of looks over and he sees the med kit just a, like a meter away. And they need that med kit now more than ever. They, they, they desperately need it because the other med kit is with the guys on the flat rock because the medics are over there. One of the medics yep. is over there. And uh, this kid Actually, is... I think um, when when Stu Pearson steps on the mine the first time, he was actually carrying one of the med kits, I think. Oh, that's... Yeah, that maybe that's the one that blew over... Yeah, 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 yeah. So you've got one med kit that's basically been blown all the hell over there. No one's getting that. Right. Um, yeah, and, and what what they need in this situation is tourniquets and mm -hmm. morphine. Right. Um, and, and they're running low. Yeah, and the, the second medic was at that triage site, but he was close enough to the rocks that they walked in on from the goat track that they were able to pull him out. And two guys take him out of there. And yeah. they try to walk him back. And these are scenes that we can't show you because of, you know, YouTube and everything. But he has a lung injury. Like his lung is punctured from the yeah. explosion. And there's sequences where he has to stop on the trail and they have to literally like give, drain his lung or give him an airway, you know. Yeah, and, and him, him being the medic, he knows what's going on. And he's trying to right. talk to his soldier. He's like saying to this soldier, he, he gives him a scalpel uh -huh. and... Um, and a, and a biro with the with mm -hmm. the center taken out, and he's like, "Right, you need to cut me here between this and this rib, mm -hmm. and push this pen in, mm -hmm. so that I have a way for the air to, to escape. Or otherwise, right. I'm, I'm, right. I'm going to die." And yeah, um, it's very intense, very yeah. intense sequence. Um, but uh, but yeah, so 
they're trying to figure all that out. So you got the one medic who's stuck on the rock. The other medic is being dragged back to the, or carried back to the fire base as best they can with the lung injury. Um, and the kid who's stuck out there with Stu and Mark being wounded is, is saying, I think I can reach this one med kit. But at that point, everybody's like, whatever anybody does, don't move. Kid, kid, don't worry about me. Wait, I'm nearly there. Kid, don't do it. No, no, kid, kid, don't. Every single motion is a risk at this point. Yeah. It is taking your life in your hands. Um, and he, the, the medic who said, don't do it, don't do this. Like, don't take that risk. He's torturing himself because they've got the guy on the stretcher on the flat rock stabilized for the most part. And now the other medic is wounded and gone. And he's the only guy that, can really help them because he's trying to tell the kid who just grabbed the med kit. Okay. Look, what you got to do is you got to put this tourniquet on this guy's arm. Cause Mark has this grizzly uh, under the armpit wound. And yeah. the kid is like, I, I don't even know where a tourniquet's going to work with this kind of injury. Like it's, it's underneath here. It's not, it's not here, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's taken yeah. out like the mm -hmm. side of his chest cavity Right, the inside of his arm. Right, and he's like, "Well, where do I put a tourniquet on? Like, is it mm -hmm. his arm fairly?" Yeah, and then he's like, "Hanging on." Yeah, he's like, "Well, take the shirt and just stuff this sh shirt up up there, like anything to keep keep the wound sealed." And um, and then he realizes, "I've got to get over there," and all yeah. of his buddies are just like, "There is no way that you can get over there without doing something really stupid." And he's and so then this moment happens where he decides what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my own med bag, my backpack, my med kit backpack as my island. And I'm going to throw it as far as much as far as I can jump. And if it hits the next piece of ground and it doesn't blow up, then I'm going to take the risk and jump on to the backpack, which is yeah. still not a guarantee of anything because. There, there are mines everywhere. Like he, you know, he could, like we said, he could throw the backpack into that area and nothing happens. But then the moment he jumps on it, so he's taking a massive risk, but he's trying to leapfrog his way over to help these guys. And so there's this, this sort of moment occurs. You just have a smudge on I don't know anything stupid. Yeah, but this is stupid. It's a bit f***ing stupid. <sighs> so he's he's literally just like super marioing his way you know a few meters at a time yeah trying to get to these guys and um then uh i'm trying to i'm trying to recall uh if, if i recall correctly uh what happens next is um the kid is trying to work with the, the bags or the, the med kits. He's still trying to work with them. And somebody throws him a water bottle. Yeah. So, so, so what happens T tug like the, mm -hmm. the senior medic who is yeah trying to do his, uh, his thought process there is like, I throw the med kit. Hopefully mm -hmm. if there isn't mine, the med kit's going to detonate it. Right. He's kind of halfway between the two groups now, mm -hmm. um, halfway between the two. And Mark, who is, you know, the most, probably the most badly wounded mm -hmm. of all of them because he's taken it, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in the chair. Right. Um, Mark is very thirsty and he's, mm -hmm. he's asking for, for water. I think he asked for water a while earlier and mm -hmm. you know, someone's done a run back up to the, to the right. fire support place, brought water down. And um, yeah, and one of the parachute regiment soldiers throws the he throws one water bottle, and there's a bit of a tense moment where he tries mm -hmm. to catch it, and then and then he throws a second water bottle and tries to catch it. And do you have that clip? I that's one of those moments where I'm looking at it, going, "I thought I had that clip, 
It's I another sign of him now. <laughs> I I swear, you know, I'm I'm pulling so many clips. Let me just see what this what this does. I let's see. Ten minutes. Yeah. That's it. I got it. Okay, cool. I've got it. Here we go. Yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah. yeah. Fucking... We've been waiting for this chopper for three fucking hours. And it's been, don't come soon. And I'm talking now. People are gonna start dying down here. So I, I kind of combine those two clips, but yeah, he gets thrown the second water bottle and he's, his knee only shifts just a little bit yeah. and that's all it took. And another mine goes off. And uh, so then that's when the, the medic who's doing the bag jump, he finally just says F this and he grabs the bag and he runs the last few, uh, the last distance over yeah. and everyone's like, don't do it. You know, and he, he's fine. He gets over there and he starts working as fast as he can, trying to, you know, do makeshift tourniquets and get people stabilized. And that that last explosion there um, also wounded the other guy who was standing and throwing the water bottles. So now he's yep. got a lung injury and he's telling him, all right, you're going to you need to lean a certain way on the rock so that it keeps yep. fluid out of your lung. Um, and then sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so ju just, you know, again, for the audience who, who has not watched this film, mm -hmm. by this point now, we have had five, la uh, sorry, four landmine detonations. Mm -hmm. Three that have been stepped on and, and, and one that was detonated by the Chinook taking off. Mm -hmm. We now have three men who have lost their lower leg. Is it three? Mm -hmm. Three, yeah. Mark, who has taken it in the chest. Another medic who was taking it in the chest but was able to walk back up. Right. Plus, has now taken it in the chest. We have six casualties. Right. At the start of this film, they explained between Normandy and Athens, there were, I think there was um, 16 at Athens and another mm -hmm. six or seven at Normandy. That's a, a quarter of their strength is now stuck in this minefield, in this wadi, very seriously injured. Yeah. You know, traumatic amputations to. To, to limbs, p people are in a very, very dire situation. So, um, and they're still waiting for the chopper. So, keep saying 10 yeah. minutes. They're still like, well, we don't have any winches that we can send right now. You're going to have to wait. And it's like, that's why you hear the guy say, he right before he screams out into the valley, because all their boys are on the periphery up at the top. You know, they're all standing guard and watching. And, He's like, he tells everybody, he says, everybody here, down here, all, Stu, all you guys, I'm about to say something and I don't want you to listen to me. He's like, I just, I don't want you to take this in. I just have to say this. Yeah. He goes, and this isn't for you, this is for everybody else. And he's like, don't listen to me. And then he screams out what you heard, which is these guys have got minutes. He's like, and we need those choppers now. Like, you know, whatever you guys are doing up there that could get us the choppers down here faster, you need to do it now. Like this, th yeah. this isn't funny anymore. Um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that I, that I, it's, it's, it's hard to encapsulate a, a movie comprehensively like this that takes place in one location because yeah. a war film like this, while this film is nowhere near of this intensity, there is a famous war film from the 1940s called Sahara that also takes place in one location and it's all about a bunch of guys, um, a, a, a multinational uh, group of guys that find each other in the North Africa desert um, on the way back from um, a battle. Uh, a, a U.S. tank crew and then some British and North African and Australian guys all kind of tag along together. They find a mosque where they think there's going to be water. They find out there is no water. Uh, they thought the well would have water, but it doesn't but they realize that they are now strategically between a German uh, battalion that's going to try a flanking maneuver on their, their guys that are fighting a battle right now. Their, their guys are going to get pinched, but they need to stop for water. And so they realize if we can trick the Germans into thinking there's water here and hold them off, even though we're like nine guys, then yeah. we can... We... So my point is that whole movie takes place essentially in one spot. And, and so it's, it's when I'm pulling clips for this, the next clip I'm about to show you is, is one of those clips in a movie like this, where there are many, many character moments. There are many, many moments where you've got guys who are 
doing that gallows humor, telling jokes. They're trying to keep their spirits up. They're, you know, asking the medic, you know, like, am I, is my wife still going to love me? You know, if I'm, if I look this way now, cause I'm all messed up and they're like, you know, yeah, yeah. sure. You know, no, don't, don't be crazy. You know, all those kind of things. And it culminates in this moment. So I, in other words, I wanted to sort of encapsulate that flavor of the movie with this one moment where the guy that has just taken the most recent chest wound, the lung injury, um, yeah. he's standing there and he or sitting there rather. And he's kind of, telling them because it's his birthday that day and he's kind of telling them how lousy his birthdays were in the real world you know like his parents didn't treat him very well and um they didn't they didn't make his birthday special ever and then he's like you know doing that humor thing that soldier humor thing he's like he can barely talk you know but he's like but this this is worse like the yeah. you know, he's like this is worse than that because they're all in disbelief like even the guys laying on the ground who are wounded are listening to the story they've literally got just lost their legs and they're listening to the story going wow your parents were horrible like i can't believe that yeah. they treated you like that on your birthday and so the medic the medic guy who just did the, the backpack jump he's like well you know what? I'm just going to play the, the bit of this clip and then you guys will get the gist. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Laura! Happy birthday, David Costa. So they start singing happy birthday to this guy. Like, and he's, it's a brilliant thing that he does because the medic knows he's like, on the one hand, I want them to conserve their oxygen, you know, intake because they're bleeding. And so they don't need to be talking, but on the other, cause the, he says that to them at one point too. But on the other hand, I've got to keep their thoughts off of the pain, the waiting, the, this, the, that. Yeah. So I'm going to use this opportunity for these guys to sing happy birthday to this dude. And it's, it, it unless you're soulless, it puts you in the thousand yard stare where you're just like, yep. you know? Um, so then, sorry, go ahead, Tony. So, so dur during this, all throughout this incident, you know, you're, you're, this is a, a, when I say a wonderful portrayal of the British soldier, I'm not saying, you know, I like to see British soldiers in this situation. It's that the the way the way they in, interact with each other, the mm -hmm. the humor, the jokes, but then also when they switch into serious mode, like right from the very very beginning, mm -hmm. I believe before Stu Pearson even gets down into the wadi to see the first casualty, he has already said on the radio, "We need a winch." Mm -hmm. That is the professional, is the well-trained level of the British soldier. Right. And in these kind of final scenes here, after, um, after, so after the fourth mine has gone off, we now have a lot of casualties. They're pretty much out of all of their medical equipment and mm -hmm. everyone is too scared to move anywhere. Right. The sense of humor keeps going, but there's also, you know, words of encouragement. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of this is coming from Corporal Mark Wright, the most yes. badly wounded person who is there. Yep. He's been laying on the ground. Even when, earlier on when, when um, I think it was Ken was trying to fit the tourniquet to him and mm -hmm. he's screaming in pain and mm -hmm. Ken's begging him. He's like, Mark, please, mate, I'm just trying to help you. Mm -hmm. And like one minute he's screaming and then he turns and he goes, you're doing a great job, Ken. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, that was him. You know, he was he was known as a a, 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 a leader among leaders within the parachute regiment. Right. Um, but, but anyone who kind of talked about him really spoke about this man in in very high regard. And, and here they are. You know, Stu Pearson at one point said, "You know, I'm, I'm just going to catch forty winks." And Mark's laying there terribly wounded, and they're kind of laying like you know top and tail, like you, like you would having a sleepover at your friend's house where you're going to share mm -hmm. a bed. Um. So Mark, you know, taps him on the head with the side of his boot and he's like, no, mate, you know, 
get up and then uh, I think he has to give some information to one of the mm-hmm. fusiliers who's writing this down. The fusilier for, for context is from a, mm-hmm. a different unit who was down at the dam who came up with right. the medic to help, which is why he actually doesn't know Stu Pearson's name and things like that. He's got to, Stu Pearson's got to give this guy his, his name, his rank, mm-hmm. his um, personnel number. And he's like, I, I, I don't know. And Mark's like, man, get it together. This is important information. Mm-hmm. And this is coming from the most badly wounded man on the ground. And, right. and to me, it just, that encapsulates that fighting spirit of the British soldier. Yeah. That when the, the chips were already down for these guys, they've, they've got no radio batteries. They're out of ammo. Mm-hmm. They're living the way they do. They have ended up in a situation that is the horrific nature of which is just be, beyond mm-hmm. my own imagination. Um, and the way they continue to to behave, it makes yeah. me. Um, <sighs> yeah, I know that, dude. That's why I don't have a lot of clips of Mark because yeah. I didn't want to burst into tears on this live stream like literally like mark just watching the clips of mark again after seeing the whole movie is like it it it, there i was i was right back there in the movie again with this guy because he's such a good leader like he's the selfless leader he's the guy that thinks of his his soldiers before himself you know and um it it yeah of course like when he's in pain at one point you can be in, you can be deliriously in pain. And so there's a few moments where he's deliriously in pain and yeah. doesn't know what's happening. But then when he snaps out of it and the shock sets in and he gets it together, he's, he's back, you know, to doing his job as best he can. Um, yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty sobering to see that. Um, and then we have finally, after four hours of, uh, in movie time, um, the, the the Blackhawks show up with the winches and they start pulling up everybody and bringing them out. And the first guy that comes down, and I don't have the clip of this, but the first guy hooked to the winch and uh, the stretcher that comes down, he's a little reckless as to where he stops and he runs over to, and they're like, you're, you just, you just dropped into a minefield. Don't run over it. You know, and he runs over and thankfully nothing happens. And then they're like, don't yeah. do that again. Yeah. Like you got to drop down right over these guys. Like they're, they're you know, and they're, he's like, okay. And not only that, they have to eventually not just winch out the wounded. They have to winch out the people that aren't wounded because they they can't let them walk back through this wadi. Like they're not even a foot. They can't they can't yep. take the risk. Um, so here's a little bit from the winch extract. And that was something that I didn't even think that I would see. I've, I, you know, was that Mark is bleeding so badly that when they they lift him up on the winch, you know, he, his blood cut starts falling down on on the medic, and it was just like I was like, well, that makes sense, but never in a movie have I seen that before. You know, like I was like, you yeah. know, it's kind of a what, um, that the. the the broader end of the film ends on the Black Hawk helicopters and then a kind of uh, memorial to these guys or, or to these, you know, telling what happened to all of them and everything, which I didn't pull a clip from because I wanted Tony to be able to choose whether or not we give you the ultimate ending of this or you watch it for yourselves. But um, I did want to point out one bit of uh, the ending of this film, which from my own film student perspective i couldn't help but notice um i'm gonna show you the very i believe it yeah it's the, it's the very first real shot in the movie transfixed against one of the most um it's not the last shot in the movie but it's one of the last shots and it's de- very deliberate i i truly believe that the screenwriters and the and the director knew what they were doing when they juxtapose these two images they started the movie this way and they effectively end the movie this way um so here it is (laughs) 
this guy, this medic started the movie in Speedos, like, and his buddies come over to him and they say, you know, don't ever enter a room unless you know how you're leaving, you know, whatever yeah. they joke with him, you know, he goes into this situation fully clothed and he finds himself because of the various explosions that he's barely survived. He finds all of his clothes pretty much have been stripped off of him and now he's bloody and burned and everything. And he's still sitting there and he he's now it's a mirror. It's a, it's the other side of a coin. It's, it's a dark mirror image of how the film began. And um, I found that really, I found that really well done. And I know that's, that's very basic language, but it was, um, I don't want to say smart because I feel like that undercuts what I'm trying to say. It was the most unconscious effective way to show an audience how things can change in 24 hours in a combat zone. Yeah. One minute you're swimming in a reservoir, the next minute you've barely survived a minefield um, that you're stuck in the middle of. Um, it's, uh, it's a stunning movie, Tony. It's a stunning, stunning movie. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you have the final word on this one. So I would much rather people go and watch the film if they haven't mm -hmm. to see how how it you know to mm -hmm. to learn the fate of the of the real men um and if they have seen it of of course they they know the fate of of the real mm -hmm. men but there was um numerous um awards for bravery um awarded here the george cross within the british military is on the same level as the Victoria Cross. It's the highest honour, but the difference between the two is the Victoria Cross can only be awarded in face of mm -hmm. um, the enemy. Right. People are awarded the George Cross for things, you know, rescuing people from burning tanks and, mm -hmm. you know, you're not actually you know, engaged in combat. There were numerous uh, George Crosses awarded here. Um. Every single person. Um, I, don't, I don't want people to. I want soldiers to. I, I, I hope in the British Army today that they use this movie as an educational tool for soldiers to learn mm -hmm. about you know the dangers of minefields and you know what to do and and you know certainly what not to do. Although there's a lot of things in this movie you, you, you shouldn't do, I, I cannot look at these soldiers and criticise their train of thought in any right. way because things happen in war. You, you, you take risks sometimes. And once they were in that situation, the main reason it escalated mm -hmm. is because they were there. People talk about you know fighting for queen and country, and any soldier who's who's been through operation operations of any kind will tell you that we don't really fight for queen and country. Right. We fight for our mates, mm -hmm. and that's really what this is. This is them. You know, at no point did any of these guys go. But I can't deal with it. I'm I'm out. I'm going to leave them. It right. never even entered their, their, their head. So um, this is a very important film. I would definitely say that in, in my life, I've been asked a number of times by friends of the family and things like that who have young sons who are considering joining the army. And they ask me, Go and have a chat with him, and I'm not. I said, well, "What do you What do you want him to get out of this chat?" You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people want me to go and talk their son out of joining the army. Right. Some of them want me to go and talk them into it, and I said, "I won't do either." And what I normally say to to a young man who has aspirations of joining the military is that you don't do this kind of thing on a whim. It can't be. Ah, oh, my. You know, I can't. I just want to see what it's about, and 
you have to be all in if you're going to go in the mm-hmm. military, in, in my mind. Yeah. Was it in, in, in the last movie where we had someone in the live chat was like, all movies glorify war? Yeah, that was in the Bridge on the River Kwai. Yeah. Well, if, if, if there's... If, if you ever wanted to prove that argument wrong, right? There's this film. Yeah, I would, I would say today that if you have a young son, and it doesn't even need to be British, it can be, you know, a young American so uh, a young American man who wants to become a marine, a soldier, an airman, a sailor, and they really, you know, also want to go into the what we call the combat arms, mm-hmm. you know, infantry artillery the, these frontline type of units show them this film mm-hmm. and if they still think it's something that they want to do um as mark says you know he he refers to arnhem mm-hmm. mount long in the falklands and he says and now kajaki we've become part of the history right and i don't think any of the guys have I don't want to speak for them, but I don't think a lot of these guys actually have regrets about being in Afghanistan in the first place. Yeah. So this is what you need to prepare yourself for. And I, all, all, all I will, I suppose, say in, in closing is that, um, you know, there is a link in the description of this video to, to help for heroes, which help for heroes helps wounded British veterans. Um, but by all means, you know, we, we I, I chose that charity because this is a, a, a British film and um, a couple of guys in this incident, in this involved in this incident, are patrons of that particular charity. But mm-hmm. by all means, if, if your f- family or friends have been affected by um, the death of American service mm-hmm. personnel or wounded service personnel, there are other fantastic charities you can donate to. If you've seen, if you haven't seen this film, go and watch this film. If you've seen it and you would like to learn more, I do highly recommend the novel that's simply called Three Para. It's by Patrick Bishop, which tells the story of the entire um, Third Battalion mm-hmm. tour. Um, there, there was a, a posthumously awarded Victoria Cross that happened sometime before this incident. Um, Corporal Brian Budd. Um, laid down his life uh, in in a firefight and was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. So many incredible stories came out of that that one particular tour, and mm-hmm. um, you know, I um, I'm I'm friends with just a couple of guys from the Third Battalion of the Parachute Regiment who were there, um, and it's an honour for me to even know these men. Mm-hmm. So, um. Thank you, Michael, for for Absolutely. watching this film. I was very confident going in that I'm really pleased you brought up the earlier comments about the the, the thick accents and mm-hmm. because I know it turned some people off and it didn't and I knew it wouldn't with you. No, uh, I'm really glad you you, you brought that up um, because you cannot understand some of that. And mm-hmm. you still understand the message of of this movie. So Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't so much like for me, it's not so much that I can't understand the words they're saying, because my ear's been trained to that for most of my life. What yeah. for what for me was, like I said, the combo of they're they're speaking in their normal uh 20-something young uh pattern. You know, every 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 young culture, whatever language you speak in, whatever accent or dialect you speak it in, in what country young people have their own way in those times and places of speaking. So they were doing that very authentically. And on top of that, they were laying in all of those military terms without any clunky exposition. So I was going, okay, I just heard flet. Now I got to actually, I need a sentence with that so that I can work, work out the acronym. You know, that's, that was my, you're, you're, you're not the average cinema viewer. I, I don't know. believe I am. <laughs> no. Um, and, you know, I, I, I am pleased that you brought those comments up at the start mm-hmm. because, you know, it it is very true that that the the average cinema goer may even turn this movie off in the first 10 minutes, not because of anything graphic. Right. Of, of struggling with this. But the, the, the thing is, 
to me, it's like le- level up. Consuming this movie is a challenge to, mm-hmm. to whatever type of human you are, from, from be it from you know trying to immerse yourself into some you know some unfamiliar accents mm-hmm. and pieces of terminology, but then to the events of the film itself. Yeah, as an audience, level up and go watch it. Exactly. Always, yeah. always. Do not level. ever tell me that the Hurt Locker is a good film. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't uh, take that kind of talk around here, savvy. <laughs> uh, uh, we, <laughs> speaking, speaking of uh, the Hurt Locker specifically, uh, not specifically, but uh, in it, relative to that, um, we have now watched a very, very intense, excellent war film, and. While I don't want to go back into watching a, a horrible war film on the next go around, I do feel like a tone shift might be in order on the next war stories to kind of, you know. So I I posit this. We don't have to agree on it now. You know my feelings about the movie I'm about to mention. But if you I've have got- a, Okay, go ahead. I've I've got a I've got some notes written down here. Okay. You know, bullet points for the movie, but also I'm like suggest to Michael at the end that we need a shift in tone. <laughs> and um if you're about to say where eagles dare, then we we're, we're probably better friends than we realize. <laughs> Uh, well, then I guess we're better friends than we realize. Because I was about to suggest where Eagles Dare. I was trying to find something that wasn't World War II, but I just thought, you know, I want to watch something excellent. Like I don't, I don't. As tempting as it is to like throw caution to the wind and be like, "Hey, Tony." Let's destroy Kelly's heroes on the next one. I didn't want to do that either for multiple reasons, but I was still kind of thinking like Clint Eastwood, like, and I thought, what about where Eagles dare? Like we could do that one and just kind of. Richard Burton. Oh, so good. When a hundred percent, we're we're doing it. Okay. When we do the next show, we'll Uh put our, um, um, you know, the the display name feature that it's got in Mm -hmm. StreamYard. But one of us will be broadsword and one will be Danny Boy. <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't wait. Um I haven't seen that movie in such a long time. I'm 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 looking for that's a really enjoyable movie. And I'm do you uh, do you need a copy? No, I think I have it. Okay, okay. Okay. Because yeah. if because if not, I'm gonna find a way to like gift you the money to buy it. Like I I want, you know, <laughs> I wanna I if you haven't seen it in a long time, like it is it's it's fictional like but it's set in a real war and that means it qualifies for war stories um not yep. all of our war stories have to be authentic um but a well written fictional war story and compelling and just I, I don't want to say too much about it now for people who haven't seen it but ah oh, okay we're doing where eagles dare i can't yep. wait yeah and i think if i look at the timing as well between like now and and me so we do this show every two weeks i leave for america in like five weeks i want to say i leave Mm -hmm. um you know it'll be be about six weeks when i kind of finally meet up with you with you guys in georgia um so if we do this in two weeks time there might not be one two weeks after that because the following week will be so it's going to be where eagles dare and then an Iconicon special episode of this. Oh, that'd be great. You, me, and Melinda, and Matthew Kearns, Matt Movie 611, doing Rambo 3. Is this just an idea that's just come to you right now? Like, have you been. No, this like, is on the Iconicon show. Oh, see, everybody, this is proof positive. I'm not on the Iconicon planning committee by design, and I'm okay. I, yeah. I didn't want to be. There's a reason for it. That's very exciting. I think we should do that. Yep. So, oh. I, all right, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. All right. Awesome. Yep. 
Okay, that means I'm definitely going to have to wear, even though it's now getting hotter in Georgia, for that one, I'm going to have to br break out my my uh, battle dress again. So I'm going to have to do that, have a, <laughs> my army jacket on for that one. Um, all right, awesome. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. For those of you who haven't seen it, please consider uh, checking out Kajaki, Kilo yep. 2 Bravo. And uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks where we will be discussing Where Eagles Dare with Clint Eastwood, Richard Burton, and the lovely Ingrid Pitt. So yeah. we will see you guys later. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you guys. <laughs>